Right? Peace. Peace, brother. How you doing? Just trying to get everything set up. Okay, that's good. Let's see something. I'm trying to see if anybody can see my screen. Okay. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. Okay. Cool. All right. Sorry about that, you guys. Um, I'm currently. Okay. 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 All right. Sorry about that, you guys. Um, I was currently dealing with some te technical difficulty. So I was trying to get this whole thing set up. All right, so let's get back to it, shall we? So the uh, topic is the black matriarch, the black matriarchy and the um, matrifocal and also the African American family structure. So that's the topic. And um, to get on to this topic, I want to go back to what the discussion, the initial discussion was, or the initial topic, which was um, deal with the legitimate, illegitimate child and love child. So 
to give a recap of what the love child is. A love child at that time was an illegitimate child, meaning that someone that was born outside of wedlock or children that was born outside of wedlock. And then those who were uh, who was uh, born in wedlock was considered as legitimate children. All right. So those legitimate children was able to inherit the rights of not only the mother, but also the father. But if you was the illegitimate child, you will only inherit the rights of the mother, but not the father, because your mother and father was not married to each other. OK, so I had used the example of a song by the Diane, by Diana Ross and the Supremes, and it was called A Love Child. It was a very touchy lyrics, um, just basically giving a description of a woman who happened to be single and unmarried and young, and she came up in poverty uh, in the inner city. So with that being said, um, her story was used to describe her love for her child. However, because she was not married, it was looked upon as an embarrassment for a woman to have kids outside of wedlock. And the laws at that time period, like with the birth certificate, if the father and the mother's not together by marriage, then the father, then the mother's name would be just on the birth certificate, not the father's. So they will all make it consider her as being a single parent. All right. So to get into that concept, I um wanted to continue where I left off. Let me turn the computer over here. Okay, I wanted to continue where I left off and give me a second, you guys. Okay. So I wanted to continue where I had left off, and that was dealing with the black nature arc and African American family and um the uh, matrifocal. So what is the black matriarch? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into the definition. Okay. Uh, give me a second. Because I'm still trying to learn this. Hold on. Hold on. Give me one second, you guys. I'm trying to share the screen. Okay, so I don't know if you guys can see it, um, but if not, I'm going to go ahead and read it anyhow, because I've been dealing with this thing all day. And it's been very frustrating. So I'm on the Wikipedia website, okay? And according to... All right, so I'm on the um, Wikipedia map website, and the term black matriarchy, let me go ahead and read it. So black matriarchy is a term for a black American family mostly led by women. All right, and going down to where it says first usage, the usage was first brought to national attention in 1965 by sociologist and later Democratic Senator Daniel Patrick Monahan in the Monahan Report, also known as the Negro Family, the case for national action. Monahan's report made the argument that the relative absence of nuclear families, those having both a father and mother present in Black America would greatly hinder further black social economic process that's interesting that's an interesting report so let's go in and look at the report first let's talk about who daniel uh monahan was 
So here's a little bit of his biography here. Uh, Daniel Monahan was an American politician, sociologist, and diplomat, a member of the Democratic Party. He represented New York in the United States Senate and served as an advisor to the Republican U.S. President Richard Nixon. Born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, Monahan moved at a young age to New York City following a stint in the Navy. He earned a PhD in history from Tufts University. He worked on the staff of New York Gover Governor W. Avell Harriman before joining President John F. Kennedy administration in 1961. He served as an assistant secretary of labor under Kennedy and President Lyndon B. Johnson, devoting much of his time to the war on property. In 1965, he published the controversial Monha Report. Monha left the uh, Johnson administration in 1965 and became a professor at Harvard University. And so in 1969, he accepted Nixon offer to serve as an assistant to the president for uh, domestic policy. And he was elevated to the position of counselor to the president later that year. He left the administration at the end of 1970 and accepted appointed as United States ambassador to India in 1973. He accepted President Gerald Ford's appointment to the position of United States ambassador to the United Nations in 1975, that holding that position until 1976 when he won election to the Senate. Monihan represented New York in the Senate from 1977 to 2001. He served as chairman of the Senate Environment Committee from 1992 to 1993 and as a chairman of the Senate Finance Committee from 1993 to 1995. He also led the Monaghan Secrecy Commission, which studied the regulation of class classified information. He emerged as a strong critic of President Ronald Reagan's foreign foreign policy and opposed President Bill Clinton's health care plan. He frequently broke with liberal positions but opposed welfare reform in the 1990s. He voted against the defense of marriage at the the was it the North American Free Trade Agreement and the Congressional Authorization uh, for the Gulf War. He is tied with J.K. Javis as the longest serving senator from state of New York. All right, so that's a little bit of his biography there. All right, that's who he was. He was the one that came up with the main high report. All right, so let's read what the main high report is. Okay. All right, so give me a second. All right. Okay, so okay. So the the Negro family, the case for national action. The Negro Family, the case for national action known as the Mainheim Report, 1965, was written by Daniel Patrick Mainheim, an American sociologist serving as a, an assistant secretary of labor under President Lyndon B. Johnson of the United States. Okay, in 1976, in 1976, Mainheim was elected to the first of several terms as U.S. Senator from New York and continued to serve liberal programs to try to end poverty. His report focused on the deep roots of black poverty in the United States and controversially concluded that the high rates of families headed by single mothers would greatly hinder progress of black towards economic and political equality. Mainheim argued that the rise in black single mother families was caused not by a lack of jobs, but a destruction vein in ghetto culture, which would be traced to slavery times and continued discrimination in the American South under Jim Crow. Black sociologist E. Franklin Frazier had, in, had introduced 
the idea in the 1930s, but Monaghan was considered one of the first academics to defy conventional social science wisdom about the structure of property. As he wrote later, the work began in the most orthodox setting, the U.S. Department of Labor to establish at some level of statistical consensus what everyone knew, the economic condition, the term and social condition, whereupon it turned out that what everyone knew was evidently not so. All right. Okay. 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 So let me go ahead and stop sharing the screen. I'm going to go back to that. But let's talk about this. All right. So, so far, this man who happened to be a sociologist, a Caucasian guy, he did a report on the family household, the African American family household, and he realized, realized there were so many single mothers. So, based on his prediction, based on his research, that he said a single parent household, right, will affect the black economy or bring hindrance later in the future. And now, let's start right there. Um, do I agree with that argument? In his case, in this case I do, only because if we look at it today, women, I mean, even in the time period, women did not make as much money as men. So it's enough to pay the bills, but it may, it may not be enough for you to put food on the table. Or it may be enough for you to pay your rent, but it's not enough for you to pay for your electricity. So as we can see today, we can see this dynamic taking place. Right? We can see this um, generational wealth crisis going on. Because you will come to find out that majority of black women are on welfare. All right, they're on welfare, they on food stamps, and then some of them may not have welfare, but they got food stamps. So you will come to find out most black women in our community have this food stamps or again some form of government assistance because where they working at, many work a nine to five job and they may not make enough money. So they have to go through the process of not only getting their kids into daycare, but also trying to put food on the table. So in a way I see exactly where he was coming from. So this, people might argue that, oh, it's racism and this, that, and the other, and Linda B. Johnson was racist or whatnot, but you have to look at the statistics at that time. Okay, and this was during the time of the late 60s, early 70s. You got to look at the condition of what African American was going through, which is why he started the Head Start program. Because many people that was in the low-income community could not afford it. They could not afford to put their kids in daycare. Now, I'm going to go ahead and read up on uh, the next individual who happened to be a black sociologist. Um, e. Franklin uh, Frazier. So I'm going to read up on him. And then I'm going to continue on to the next topic which is de dealing with the matrifocal. So, no, well, no, I'm going to continue with the black matriarch, and then I'm going to the um, uh, matrifocal, but I want to get into who is this um, individual by the name of E. Franklin Frazier. So, all right, hopefully you guys can see my screen. Let me put the screen up. 
y'all can see it. I got to get the hang of this thing. So y'all please forgive me. I'm not good at this. I'm not good at this at all. All right, let's look them up. Okay. So who was Edwin Franklin Frazier? All right. Edward, Edward Franklin Frazier was an American sociologist and author, publishing as E. Franklin Frazier. His 1932 Ph. dissertation was published as a book titled The Negro Family in the United States, 1939. It analyzed the historical forces that influenced the development of African-American family from the time of slavery to the mid-1930s. The book was awarded in 1940, um, was it Ennis, Ennisville Wolf Book Award for the most significant work in the field of race relation? It was among the first sociological works on blacks research and written by a black person. And he didn't get a lot of credit. That's interesting. So in 1948, Frazier was elected as the first black president of the American Sociological Association. He published numerous other books and articles on African-American culture and race relation. In 1950, Frazier helped draft the U UNESCO statement, The Race Question. Frazier wrote a dozen books in his lifetime, including The Black Bourgeoisie, a critique of the black middle class in which he questioned the effectiveness of African-American businesses to produce racial equality. Okay, so let's read a little bit about his biography. Okay. Frazier was born in Baltimore in 1894 as one of five children of Jane H. Frazier and a bank messenger and Mary Clark Frazier, a homemaker. He attended to Baltimore public school, which were legally segregated in those decades. Upon his graduation in 1912 from the Color High School and Training School in Baltimore, renamed in 1923 as Frederick Douglass High School, Frazier was awarded the school's annual scholarship to Howard University, a prominent historically black college. His He graduated with honors from Howard in 1916. Frazier was a top scholar pursuing Latin, Greek, German, and mathematics. He also participated in extracurricular activities, including drama, political science, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and the Intercollective Socialist Society. He was elected as class president in both 1915 and 1916. Wow, he has a lot. Following graduation from Howard, Frazier attended Clark University in uh, was it Worcester, Massachusetts, where he earned a master's degree in 1920. The topic of his thesis was new current new currents of thought among the colored people of America. During his time at Clark, Frazier first began to study sociology, combining his approach with his deep interest in African American history and culture. Fraser spent 1920 to 1921 as a Russell Shade Foundation Fellow at the New York School of Social Work, later part of Columbia University. All right, so Fraser taught sociology at Morehouse College, a historically black institute in Atlanta, where he established what is known in the 21st century as the Atlanta University School of Social Work. In 1927, Frazier published his article titled The Pathology of Race Prejudice in Forum. Using Friday, was it Freudian terms, he wrote that prejudice was abnormal behavior characteristic of insanity including dissociation, delusional thinking, rationalization, projection, and paranoia. White people in the South, he argued, were literally driven mad by the Negro complex to the point that men and women who are otherwise kind and law-abiding will indulge in the most revolting forms of cruelty towards Black people. So, in Atlanta paper, Carrie in editorial against Frazier work, which indirectly publicized his 
article are already planning to move to Chicago. Frazier and his family left Atlanta early because of severe threats against them due to controversy and hostility amongst whites generated by his article. He had a fellowship from University of Chicago Sociology Department. His studies at Chicago accumulated in his early in his earning a PhD in 1931. All right, so we're going to skip down a little bit. In his research and writing, Frazier adopted an approach that examined economic, political, and attitudinal factors that shape the system of social relationships. He continually pressed to find the social reality, quote unquote, in a contest he investigated. His stature was recognized by his election in 1948 as the first black president of American Sociological Association. He was established as leading American scholar on the black family and was also recognized as a leading theorist on the dynamics of social change and race relation. Hmm. Okay. Oh, Frazier position emphasized African-American cultural developments as a process of accommodation to new condition in the Americas. Frazier Black Bourgeoisie in 1957, English translation of a work first published in French in 1955, was a critical examination of the adaptation by middle-class African-Americans and some servant uh, conservatism. His books received mixed reviews and harsh criticism from the black, middle, and professional class. Yet, Frazier stood solidly by his argument that the black middle class was marked by conspicuous consumption, wish fulfillment in a world of make-believe. Okay. Wow. I see why he received a lot of backlash. That's deep. So, he... Basically, Frazier, let me go back to the top, okay. So E. Franklin Frazier gave harsh criticism about the black bourgeoisie class and telling them basically, you ain't living the American dream like you think. You know, you live in a make-believe. And so he was pretty radical in his time, not just only receiving threats from the whites, but receiving harsh criticism from the blacks. So this man actually studied um, how the slavery has affected the uh, African-American family. And see, this is something that you rarely even hear about, even with people like Dr. Umar Johnson. They don't really go into the details about how the whole black nature arc and the whole, um, the Negro family concept took place. So it's like you really have to go into the research and go into the information to find this out. But I see why this man has not really received credit for the work that he has done. So it was really given to Daniel Patrick Monheim. But he was the first to do the research before this guy had did. But not to say that neither one was incorrect. I mean, they... They did the studies, but it's just ironic how this guy here, his work was not really discussed or really talked about, especially within the sociology field or psychology field when we talk about um, things pertaining to African Americans. So um, this is a powerful information right here. But let me go ahead and continue to the black matriarchy. Okay. Okay. Um all right, so I'm 
I'm going to read about the background and then I'm going to read about the content and influence. Yeah, so I'm going to read background. While writing the Negro family, the case for national action, Monhai was employed in a political appointee position at the U.S. Department of Labor, hired to help develop policy for the Johnson administration in its war on poverty. In the course of analyzing statistics related to black poverty, Monhai knows something unusual. Rates of black male unemployment and welfare enrollment, instead of running parallels as they always had, started to diverge in 1962 in a way that would come to be called Mona High Scissors. When Mona High published his report in 1965, the out of wedlock birth rate among African, I mean, among blacks was 25%, much higher than that of whites. Mm. And it's still like that to this day. It's still that way to this day. To this day, it's still that way. Okay. Okay, so I know I have some people on here watching. You know, I don't I don't really trust Facebook that much because they don't be telling the truth half of the time as far as the viewers. I know I have more people on here watching than what they're telling me. But um let me go ahead and continue. All right. So say something. All right, give me one moment. Trying to hold on. Let me. Okay. Give me one second. Do, 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 do. I'm Okay, um, shit.
Damn. 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 Okay, I was trying to see if I can get some people on here. Man, this some bullshit. All right, so. All right. Okay. So going back to what I was reading, um, I don't know what's going on. In the instruction, I mean, introduction to his report, um, Monahan said that the gaps between the Negro and most other groups in American society is widening. He also said that shit. He also said that the collapse of the nuclear family and the black lower class would preserve the the gap between possibility for Negroes and the other and other groups in favor of the ethnic groups. He acknowledged the continued existence of racism and discrimination within society despise the victories that black had won by civil rights les legislation. Monahan concluded the steady expansion of welfare program can be taken as a measure of the steady disintegration of the Negro family structure over the past generation in the United States. More than 30 years later, X. Craig Watkins described Monahan's conclusion representing hip hop culture and production of black cinema. The report concluded that the structure of the family life in black community constituted a tangle of pathology capable of perpetuating itself without assistance from the white world. And that at the heart of deterioration of the fabric of Negro society is the, the deterioration of the Negro family. It is the fundamental source of the weakness of the Negro community at the present time. Also, the report argued that the major article structure of black culture weakened the ability of black men to function as the as authority figures. That particular notion of black familial life has become a widespread, if not dominant, paradigm for comprehending the black, I mean, the social and economic disintegration of the late 20th century black urban life. So let's stop at the part that says, at the, hold on, at the heart of the deterioration of the fabric of Negro society is the deterioration of the Negro family. So to take away the Negro culture, basically, is to take away the Negro or the black family dynamic. That's basically what it's saying. Hmm. See. Okay. Um, what else do I want to read? So, because it's a lot to it. So, I'm going to go ahead and um, read the part about influence. The, the Money High report generated considerable controversy and has long-lasting and important influences. Writing to Lyndon 
Lyndon Johnson, Mona High argued that without access to job and means to contribute meaningful support to a family, black men will become systematically alienated from their roles as husband and fathers, which would cause rates of divorce, child abandonment, and that's very common. There's a lot of child abandonment that's really going on. And out of wedlock births to skyrocket in the black community, a trend that had already begun by the mid-1960s, leading to vast increases in the numbers of households headed by females and the higher rates of poverty, lower educational outcomes, and inflated rates of child abuse that are allegedly associated with these factors. Hmm. And this comes from the Money High report. Is that's not what's happening today? Is that's not what's going on today? Is that's not what's going on today? Hmm. So let's continue on reading. Okay, reception and following debate. From the time of its publication, the report has been sharply attacked by black and civil rights leaders as an example of white patronizing cultural bias and racism at various times. The report has been condemned or dismissed by NAACP and other civil rights groups and leaders such as Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton. Critics accuse Monahan of relying on stereotypes of black family and black men, implying that blacks had inferior academic performance, uh, portrayed crime and pathology as endemic to black community and failing to recognize the cultural bias and racism in standardized tests had contributed to apparent low achievement by blacks in school. Let's get back. Racism is what's it? Cultural bias and racism and standardized tests. That's where the concept of the bitch test come from, because it was to combat this whole stereotypical concept that African Americans did not achieve well on standardized tests, and they could not. They didn't have the. Um, they didn't do academically well or they weren't um, as academ academically smart. So um, if I get a chance to, I'm going to go into this whole bitch test. It's literally called the bitch test, which called, which stands for Black um, Intelligence. Um, I forgot what the T stands for. And cultural homogeneity. So... I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look up what the uh, bitch test 100 is. And it started by Dr. Robert Williams, who happened to be a black psychologist. So this is really interesting. And it kind of ties into that whole cultural bias and racism in the standardized test concept. So anyways. The report was criticized for threatening to undermine the place of civil rights on the national agenda, leaving a vacuum that could be filled with a politics that blamed blacks for their own troubles. Interesting. Um, so at that time, they felt like basically, according to people like Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, and the NAACP, they felt like this guy was marginalizing and uh, stereotypical, being stereotypical about the black family in his report and not really looking at the actual statistics and understanding statistics. But, you know, they all make the accuse of being racist. Basically, that's what it's saying. Okay. Um, so in 1987, um, Hortonis Spillers, a black feminist academic, criticized the Monaghan Report on 
semantic grounds for its use of matriarchy and patriarchy when it described the African-American family. She argues that the terminology used to define white families cannot be used I mean, cannot be used to define African-American families because of the way slavery has affected African-American family. Okay. That seemed like a reasonable argument right there because, yes, slavery has really uh, took a toll over the family structure and psychologically because we're so used to being domesticated and being enslaved. So that makes sense. Um, yeah, so I'm, um, I'm going to finish up this part right here. Then I'm going to skip on down to a feminist critique. Uh, what is it? Scholar Roderick Ferguson traced the effects of the Monahan report in his book, a a reration in black, knowing that noting that black nationalists disagree with the report suggesting that the state provided black men with masculinity, but agreed that black men needed to take back the role of the patriarch. Ferguson argued that the Monahan report generated um or hege hegemonic discourses about minority communities and national nationalists segments in the black community. Ferguson uses the discourse of the Monaghan Report to, in, to inform his queer of color critique, which attempt to resist national discourse while acknowledging a simultaneously of oppression through coalition building. African-American economist and writer Walter E. Williams has praised the report for its finding. He has also said that the solution to the major problem that confirmed many black people won't be found in the political arena, especially not in Washington or state capitals. Thomas Sowell, an African-American economist as well, also has also praised the Monahan Report on several occasions. His book, his 1982 book, Race and Economic Mentions, Monahan Reports, and in 1998, he asserted that the report may have been the last honest government report on race. And in 2015, Sawyer argued that time have proved correct Monahan's core idea that African-American poverty was less a result of racism and more and more a result of single parent families. One key fact that keeps getting ignored is that the poverty rate among black married couples has been in single digits every year since 1994. A political commentator, Heather McDonald, um, wrote for National Review in 2008, conservatives on all strikes routinely praised uh, Daniel Patrick Monahan's uh, um, pre, pre was it? Oh my God! Persistence for warning in 1965 that the breakdown of the black family during the achievement of racial equality. They rightly blast those liberals who denounce Monahan's report. And sociologist Steven Steinberg argued in 2011 that the Monahan report was condemned because it threatened to derail the black liber liberation movement. Hmm. Well, that was a lot of reading, but um, yeah, that was a many arguments again to break it all down. Uh, one argument believed that this guy was being stereotypical and trying to create some ideology about black family that don't exist, and then. The others felt like, well, he was actually telling the truth and because it speaks for itself over generations. So you got both arguments on both sides. You got those who were considered to be liberals that argue against it, said, no, that's not the case. Um, This whole uh, thing about the family dynamic structure, what you're trying to claim is you're trying to make it look like the black woman is just the face of single parenting, and that's not true. 
and then the other say, well, you know what? She is the face of single parenting because obviously there's not enough men in the household. And because when you don't have enough men in the household, right, and you have the women doing it by themselves, collectively speaking, the family, the family structure falls apart. And so, and now they don't only fall apart as far as um, socially, but they fall apart is also so financially because you don't have somebody else who comes in and bring the income in the household, right? So, and if the woman is doing it all by herself, especially in knowing that she's not making enough money, then yeah, that really can uh, put a lot of effect on the family. So we have to also go into the concept about the feminization of poverty, but I'll do that another day. Um, yeah, so I, one of these days, I'm gonna go into the concept about the feminization of poverty, and I'm gonna break that down too which how, how this part can tie into this whole uh, money hand report in a sense and also Ferguson report as well. So, um, so yeah, I would do that another day, another time, but um, let's continue. Okay, so let's go ahead and go down to the feminist critique. Hmm. Interesting. Let me get that off here. Sorry about that. Okay, interesting. So, feminist critique. Feminists argue the Monaghan Report present a male-centric view of social problems. They believe that the Monaghan failed to take into account basic um, rational insistences for marriage. He did not acknowledge that women had historically engaged in marriage in part out of need for material resources as adequate wages were otherwise denied by cultural tra tradition excluding women from most jobs outside the home. The, with, with the expansion of welfare in the United States in the mid to late 20th century, women gained better access to government. Keep track of time. Okay. Women gain better access to government resources and tended to reduce family and child poverty. Women also increasingly gain access to the workplace. As a result, more women were able to subsist independently when men had difficulty finding work. Okay. So let me stop right here. Um... So with this whole feminist report about the male century, it goes to show that with the feminist organization, right? See, this is why I don't really support them. I really don't support them only because they only see things from a one-sided point of view and not looking at the overall dynamic. Uh-uh. Yes, it is important that you for women's right and women's liberation, women being able to be treated as humans in society. But when it comes to the total dismiss of the male or to just being straight antagonist on the male, then it can be problematic because now you create a more dichotomy in this case. Um, when I'm reading this, I mean, I have to pretty much disagree um, because even then, a lot of women back then did not really work as much. And if they did have a job, there was only certain job position they were able to do, right? Because women couldn't work certain positions. They had what was called a pink collar position. They had the blue collar position and they had the white collar position. Now, the women who worked in the white collar position were mostly Caucasian women not African-American women. And if they did, they weren't getting paid as much as their uh, Caucasian counterparts, right? So most women did the blue collar position and they were still getting paid the lowest, 
And then when they was working in the pink collar position, which is basically like teaching and nursing and stuff like that, that I will go into another time. Um, again, they still was not making income. So the last part where it says, as a result, more women were able to subsist independently when men had difficulty finding jobs. Okay, they did the best they could, but they weren't really well off. You know what I'm saying? To this day, many women are still living in the inner city. Okay? You have very few or you have those who slowly being able to progress and move into like the middle class neighborhood or suburbs. But outside that, most are in the inner city. And so I have a view about the whole feminist organization. Again, that's a topic for another day. So that will be on my bucket list. Uh, yeah. So let's see. We're going to go to where it says counter respond. The Clary Monaghan prophetic Ken Aluta in his 1982, the underclass proclaimed that one cannot talk about poverty in America or about the underclass without talking about the weakening family structure of the poor. The Baltimore Sun and the New York Times ran a series on the black family in 1983, followed by 1985 Newsweek article called Monaghan, I Told You So. In 1986, CBS aired the documentary The Vanishing Black Family, produced by Bill Moyer, a one-time aide to President Johnson. He affirmed Monaghan's finding. In 2001 interview with PBS Monahan said, my view is we had stumbled onto a major social change in the circumstances of postmodern society. It was not long ago in this past century that an uh, anthropologist working in London, a very famous man at the time, what's his name, Malinowski, um, postul postulated what he called the first rule of anthropology that in all known societies, all male children have a knowledge male parent. That's what we found out everywhere. And well, maybe it's not true anymore. Human society changed. By the time of that interview rate of the number of children born to single mothers had gone up in the in white, with excuse me, in the white and Hispanic working classes as well. Mm, that's interesting, but they ain't gonna be talked about. But that's real interesting, right there. That you won't hear much about the single parentings in the white community, and you hear some of it in the Hispanic community, but not really in the white community. Now that that's very interesting, right there. All right, and so okay. So how much time do I have left? Okay, so I won't be on here very long. Um, so I read what I read and let me see something getting back to the concept about the black matriarchy um, the negative effect alright some will disagree with the idea of black matriarchy because they see black matriarchy being used in a derogatory way. The author of the article, The Myth of the Black Matriarchy, argues that black women were seen in a threatened way and their position in the family has resulted in psychological castration of the black male and has produced a variety of other negative effects. These negative effects include low educational achievement, personality disorder, juvenile delinquency, etc. And I hear that argument to this day about the personality disorder and juvenile delinquency. And see, it's very crazy that most black women be accused of that because their children grow up and become, become problematic. So my argument is whether you have both parents in the household at the end of the day when your child step out into this world, they're going to choose who they want to encounter, who they want to interact. You have what's called peer pressure. All right. Okay. 
All right, so let's talk about the effects of absent fathers. The father in the family structures is the foundation of that family system. The father should provide stability to the family, which keeps the family in order and functioning. A study by Don Lemon shows that about 67% of black children are living in the household without their fathers. Fathers plays an emotional role in families and their absence can be detrimental to the development of their children. That's very true. For young girls, the absence of their father can influence how promiscuous the daughter is with her physical sexuality. That's very true. I, I won't deny that. Also, they may seek more attention from men and tend to have women tend to have had more physical contact with boys than other girls their age. That's usually common, so that's partly true. But the other part is even if you have both your parents, you're gonna have a child that has a chance of being very uh adventurous and curious and they're going to go out there and experiment it has been shown that boys without fathers tend to become gang affiliated more than those who have a two-parent home i can partly agree with that and then you may have a father who was a gang banger himself so or gang affiliated so that's another pathology right there in the oral sub survey the writer conducted with 25 black males ages 15 to 25 who had either been in jail or on probation or had a, crit a criminal record or had criminal charges 13 pending it was found that hold on okay yeah it was found that 21 out of the 25 subjects were raised by a single mother. 17 of them said they thought that if their fathers were present during their upbringing, it could have made a difference in their lives. These theories have been challenged by various co collected data, including data shown by the Center for Disease Control. All right. So, um, So let's stop right there. Okay. Ooh, I'm tired. Okay, so okay, so I'm gonna stop right there. Um and I am going to give my thoughts afterwards. So, oh, real quick, I want to show what the bitch test is. Just real quick. All right, here we go. All right, so the Black Intelligent Test of Cultural Homogeneity, or Bitch Test 100, is an intelligent test created by Robert Williams in 1972, oriented towards the language, attitudes, and lifestyle of African Americans. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go in here and read about what the Bitch Test is real quick, and then I'm going to have to uh, end it. The test consists of a multiple choice questionnaire in which the examinee was asked to identify the meaning of 100 words as they were then used in black ghettos. Example of words used include alley, apple, black throat, blood, boogie, jungie, and boot. The original sample used in the experiment consists of 100 white and 100 black St. Louis high school students aged 16 to 18 years old, half of them being from lower socioeconomic levels and the other half from middle income levels. Williams also had data from the from two other samples of blacks and whites. These samples include 25 black and 13 white college students from Mississippi and 19 white college, I mean white graduate students from Boston University out of 
the 200 students who participated in the original sample, the black 100 student answer A7 to 100 answer correctly and the whites answer 5100 questions correctly in the other sample, the result was similar in the black students scores being drastically different from those of the white. So basically with the whole black intelligent testing cultural homogeneity is going back into like how dealing with social linguistics in a sense. So social linguistics deals with like the language that's um the study of language languages uh, based on social interaction or you know based on culture. So like how we interact with each other as African Americans, certain terminology that we use to describe something is different from how it is being used in other cultures, particularly white cultures. Um, and that goes back to the whole study about how the cultural bias and racial and racism in the standardized test. So when the children at the time, when they took the standardized test, they didn't understand the questions on those tests. So with the question being on those tests about, you know, uh, you know, certain like certain vocabulary words they weren't familiar with. So that's when uh, Dr. Robert Williams decided that, okay, we're going to come up with a concept called the bitch test, uh, intelligent test. So we're going to have to translate some of these words into a colloquial term. I mean, into colloquial terms or to where it could be into a child's understanding. And once you be able to translate, then they could be able to properly answer the questions. So, yeah. But to end it all, because um, I got to get going. I know you lying. I know I had more people watching in this. Facebook talking about some zero views. I know I had more people watching. But anyways, in all conclusion, um, I know it was a lot of reading that I was doing, but again, we have to address these things from an academic point of view or from an intellectual point of view, okay? Um, it's very easy to get into an emotional discussion about black men and black women, how black men are not in the household or how black women are pushing the men away from the family, et cetera, without really looking at it from the scholastic point and understand the academics behind it as far as the research and the studies have done. So yes, um, I use Wikipedia because it's much easier, but um, to do extended research, you would have to go beyond Wikipedia, right? However, there was some great source of information in those in that website, so I figured that it would be a lot useful for me to just go on there and use it. But anyways, um, uh, getting down to this, the whole concept of the black matriarch, do I feel it's a derogatory term? In a way, I do, only because it's like, it's basically like describing the woman as, the black woman as, oh, she's the only single parent. So black, if she's a black woman and she has children, more than likely she's a single parent or she's automatically a single mother. And so I think that because major art can go in any culture, it don't have to just be a black culture. So in a sense, I see the derogatory term behind it, but also I understand because it was a description of describing the, um, the state of African-Americans at the time and to this day, as far as the household and the incomes and stuff. Um, let me see, what else I want to say? I got to drink some water. Woo. Um, and also as far as the African-American family structure, we have to understand this. Whether your child is raised by a single parent or not, at the end of the day, what's really going to affect that child is when the choices they make, when they once they leave their parents' home and enter into the world, right? 
once they go into the world and go out to society that's what's going to really affect the child psychology that's what that's when your child start having social experiment okay so it's about what type of influence that your child have which deals with the um which would deal with like the concept of epigenetics in a sense so and when we talk about epigenetics we're not talking about just your gene expression but we talking about you know social influences and how your child being nurtured based on their society or based on the environment they come from. So you may raise your child to be a very decent person, right? Or you may raise your children on religious and spirituality culture, but the moment they step outside your home is when they start to deal with the world. So this will eliminate this whole argument about all of this is the black woman's fault because the, the, the black man is not there and how she raising the black children, yada, yada, yada. Okay, you can give some part of the blame to the woman for how she's educating her kids. But at the end of the day, even if the father's in the household, even if he's a strong male figure, eventually that child is going to make a conscious decision to do what he or she wants to do. Okay? Um, and then another thing, this is where the contradiction comes in. And I'm going to speak on this. So some people might get mad, but it is what it is. Uh, the contradiction is one minute. The argument is it's important for the black fathers to be in the household. Okay. But then at the same time, you condone, there are people that condone same-sex parenting. So if you condone same-sex parenting, meaning that two women raising children, then how can you argue that the father needs to be in the household? How can't you make the argument that the father needs to be in the household if you're the same people that's condoning um, same-sex parenting? Because if you argue that the father's is important and he needs to be there, then that means you cannot yeah, you cannot be in support of same-sex couple being becoming parents or uh, adopting children, right? I mean, let's be logical. That that's the argument right there. You can't say in one breath that fathers need to be in the household and father is very important. But in another breath, you support the ideology of same parenting as well. Because see, now that's the contradiction and it brings the conflict. The conflict of interest. Like, okay, how does that work? In the same way, you can't say that, oh, the mother needs to be in the house. But then you could don two men being parents to a child. How does that work? It don't really work. It's a conflict right there. And it shows the contradiction. But anyways, I got to get going, you guys. Um, uh, today was a frustrating day. I was trying to learn how to operate this uh, whole stream live. And I don't know... Let's see. I see one person comment on here on this side, but it doesn't let me. For some reason, I'm not able to uh, like put in a link where people can come in and, you know, chime in or whatever. So I'm going to have to figure that out. So this is my first time using Streamlabs and hopefully I'll get better at it. And um, I don't. I don't really like it that much, but I'm trying to get used to doing things differently. So trying to, this is my first test. And anyways, I got to go. Thank you guys for watching. May peace and power elevation be to all of you. Until next time, deuces. All right, take it easy.
out. She's power. All right. Take it easy.